All right. So black holes are theoretically out there, but how do we know for sure? Um, this was a really important question because black holes were theorized before they were ever detected. So this was a very pertinent you know, piece of astronomy history. Um, so one way to observe black holes is to look at binary star systems where one of those stars in the binary system that rotate around some common center of mass has died and become a black hole. And so this is what we see in the object we call Cygnus X. So if we look at it in the optical, um, there's a star, doesn't look too exciting, right? But um, it turns out that the, uh, the living partner, living partner of the black hole um, some of its matter can get too close um, and be basically funneled into the black hole and spiral in um, along an accretion disk. So the only reason it spirals in is because this gas being pulled off the partner doesn't have the necessary orbital speed to remain in orbit. If it has less than the orbital speed, eventually its, its orbit will decay into the black hole. All right, so that's what's happening here as some of the gas gets pulled off of the partner it becomes part of an accretion disk. And this accretion disk essentially um, rubs together with friction and it gets so hot that it emits, emits in the X-ray. And this is what we observe in this same region of space when we observe in the X-ray. So X-ray um, observations allowed us to say that Cygnus X is very likely a black hole. Um, Stephen Hawking lost a bet about this, by the way. So this is one key way to observe black holes is to look for that emission from their accretion disk. Um, okay, a second way to observe black holes is we could try to directly image it. And this is the first direct image of a black hole. It's uh, M87, it's a supermassive black hole. And this also has an accretion disk around it. And what you're seeing here is the accretion disk glowing in the radio and the black hole as a shadow in its center. Um, some of the light from the accretion disk is, is also bent in strange ways. If um, you're curious about this, there are some recent articles about um, looking at the light polarization from this particular image in more detail. So this, is, this image came out a couple of years ago, but it, they're still doing research on all of the information that can be pulled out from this data. Um, so this took uh, five nights of data collection, but two years of analysis before this result was published, just to give you an idea for um, how easy it is to get data sometimes and how much time it takes to actually uh, do the work. All right, and the way that this was imaged was not by using a single telescope, a single radio telescope, but by an entire network of radio telescopes in different parts of the world. And that way, it's as if you have one single radio telescope that's the size of planet Earth, which is pretty rad. There are hundreds of researchers that are part of this collaboration um, from all over. All right, a third way we can observe black holes is by detecting the perturbations in the uh, field of space-time. So by measuring gravitational waves. So if we have a binary black hole system, sometimes they merge together into a single black hole. And if they do that, then they basically create a ripple in space-time. That's just like dropping a pebble in a pond. Um, and scientists measured the first such event, uh, a gravitational wave event in 2015. Um, the LIGO experiment, the Large Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, is a, it's actually a network of um, laser uh, interferometers. So basically they have a laser that bounces back and forth in a big cavity. The cavity is two kilometers long. Um, they're, they're shaped like this. So you have two cavities and as a gravitational wave comes down and it stretches earth one way and then the other way so that first one cavity gets longer and then shorter while the other cavity gets longer and then shorter. So by measuring the length changes in this two kilometer cavity using that laser, we can measure um, how much gravity is, uh, be, or how much space time is being stretched, which lets us know uh, the properties of that gravitational wave. So the, this observation won the Nobel Prize in 2017.
all right if you want to you can watch this video on youtube and it shows like it maps this into this into the range of human hearing and it sounds like a little chirp so i guess that's what it sounds like when black holes merge not really okay so we've got three ways so far we're looking for the accretion disk in the x-ray or we can look for a direct image in the radio or we can measure gravitational waves so far two of those have used the accretion disk this third way is the only way that hasn't um, and when we look at um, you know the masses of black holes that we find from these different methods of observation we're going to compare them to the mass of a white dwarf which is just over one solar masses um, we find neutron stars somewhere between one and eight ish solar masses we find stellar mass black holes around you know three ish to about 100 solar masses and then we know of supermassive black holes way out here at millions of solar masses so millions of stars worth of mass in a black hole but there's this range in between where we don't really know if black holes exist in that range because we have not detected them. LIGO is starting to fill in some of this picture by finding intermediate mass black holes. But for the most part, we don't really know how many are out there in this mass range. So this is an ongoing area of research trying to identify whether those black holes are there and how did they form. 